load and broadcast. Okay, so the webinar is now live. Welcome everyone. And I'm gonna let it just come up here on my end. And there we go, take it away Vishal. We have a few seconds here for, these, for the attendees to populate here. Yep. Two seconds. Welcome to our uh, March Teammate Real Estate Monthly Meeting. So today, we've got a full agenda, and we're going to be covering over construction and new builds this month. But I do want to introduce myself. My name is Vishal. I'm a coach with Teammate Real Estate. As well, I'm joined by, we have Keith Gordon, who is also a coach and our tech support. Hello. Hi, everybody. There we are. I'm up on screen. We have Chris McKenzie here, who recently joined us and is specializes in commercial real estate out of Alberta. Hey, everybody. We have Vern, Vern Bird, who is a coach with Teammate Real Estate and has been investing for over 50 years from hotels to motels to trailer parks to commercial to residential. Hello, everybody. We have Michael Reimer, who's going to be actually a guest speaker about construction and new builds. He's, uh, he's expecting a baby coming soon. Yep, coming up soon in July. <laughs> We also have our newest coach, Patrick, who's with us. Patrick recently was a student of Teammate Real Estate, and after one year of doing over millions of dollars of real estate, has now joined us as a coach. Hey, hope you guys are doing well. We also have Daryl Walsh, who's our realtor that we use at Teammate Real Estate, and we're going to be able to see what's inside of his crystal ball later today. Sorry, and I was also, muted. Good evening, everyone. And also we have Valen Vergara, who's an international real estate investor. So let's get started here, Keith, if we can go to the next slide. So who are we? We are Teammate Real Estate. Uh, we are the own, largest and only free real estate investing club. What I mean by that is that there's no monthly fees, or admission charges to come out to these monthly meetings to really learn. Our goal is to put a whole bunch of like-minded investors together to succeed as investors throughout the community. So when we put a whole bunch of people together who want to learn, we end up exceeding more together as a team. Um, we have experts all over. As I mentioned, we have local markets as well as North all over North America, as well as also international markets are covered. So at Teammate Real Estate, we have over 150 students. I think this might be outdated, but I know we're in the hundreds, well into the hundreds of uh, students, as well as partnerships in the U US and coaches as well. So at Teammate Real Estate, we do various events, um, such as these free monthly events. Uh, often every month is different topics. There's various topics. Uh, we do workshops bus tours. We also help create power teams, find joint venture partnerships, networking, and how to find money, as well as deals. A lot of our students will definitely attest to that is there are a lot of deals flowing among students in our group chats. Now, at the academy, we have various programs that we offer. Now, the level of the program is kind of related to the amount of in-depth that you want to go to the real estate. We have programs that are equivalent to bachelor's, master's, and PhD. So at our academy, we also work to get your deal insurance done. So what that really means is if you want to get a deal done, we'll work with you till you get that deal done. There's no if, ands, or buts. We will get you a deal done. So what I mean by that is it's not a catch and release program. We work with you till your deal is done. Um, there's no annual fee to work with us. It's one-on-one -on -one mentorship and sometimes two or three-on-one. Uh, we cover a lot of field training. And what I mean by field training is your coach will go in and out of houses with you to view those properties, to create maximum allowable offers and to create scope of works. Video audio training, you're part of the team and you're gonna be a part of the overall team. Okay. Uh, so here is a, is a, 
this is a, typically when we meet live in person, we'd be handing out pamphlets. I'm really hoping soon we can get back to meeting in person and it's looking hopeful with all the vaccine use. Um, so this is something we would typically have on paper, but it simply uh, talks about booking a strategy session and we will chat more towards the end of the presentation of how you can go ahead and book that. But um, if we have, we cover a whole bunch of information with respect to rehabs, rentals, the Burr, lease options, financing, JV, joint ventures, and negotiations. So why do we uh, do the first deal assurance done? So we often work, when you work with your, with your coach, you often, you're gonna be paired up with, with having online training and going through the academic modules. When this is done here, you also paired up with students who are doing deals as well. So right away, the confidence is built up and the experience is there. So when those two things come in hand in hand, the momentum keeps on coming. So I kind of laugh at the deal assurance. When I look back at the students that we have in our academy, we have, I think, our investor of the year who, did, who bought 40 units in one year and flipped two houses. We had the recent investor of the month a few months ago did five flips in one year. So the deal assurance is there and is a proven system to really show that students that work with their coaches are absolutely crushing it in the real estate industry. As well as it's not only just from the coach that they support, there's also a whole support system within Telegram and Facebook group. So when people have questions about a new build or suppliers or where to find trades, all that, it's a whole environment built into the Telegram and Facebook group, which we support. So often enough, when we say that someone has done 40 units in one year, or someone has flipped five houses in, in, a, in a year, people want to start doing the same thing. But then the words are starting to limit themselves as they say, I can't do that. Or their thoughts, or they're just thinking, that's not, that's, that's too much. Or their emotions, or the or, or other relationships that are holding them back to, to uh, really succeed. We found that you really become the person that you surround yourself by. And by surrounding yourself by a community of like-minded investors who have done what you wanted to do and who are also on the path of doing it really changes one's future. And we found that students that join and put in this in the group and put outside their comfort zone really can do what they thought they can't do. So re real estate has really allowed myself to design my lifestyle to do what I want to do when I want to do it. It's given me the flexibility to really to design when I work, where I work, and with who I work. I think, Keith, if we can jump over to the next slide, actually. If I think right, yeah, here's why I invest. So I started investing when I was 18 years old myself. I know a lot of people also got in rather young, too. And I wanted to be able to travel the world. And before COVID, I'm 29 today. And I wanted to travel to 30 countries before I turned 30. So I was on a mission and I got up to 27. And of course, the pandemic came and kept me grounded at home. Um, I, so before COVID, I was doing real estate so that I could spend my time just traveling the world. Uh, the picture in the top left is there, the Taj Mahal. And then right below that was actually a me sitting first class in, on the Air Canada flight going to India. And let me tell you, that 14-hour flight felt like two hours. It was the most comfortable flight ever. Um, but yeah, that's what real estate's really done for me. It's allowed me to travel, give me the flexibility to do what I, what I want to do with my time. I acknowledge that everyone has different whys, and this still leads to the same end result. I'm going to give a quick sponsor shout out. I'm going to skip a few as we're going to have, they're live in person and they're going to speak. But uh, for, we have Jazz Sani from J J J Jazz Sani Chartered Accountants. We have Ray Penner from Ray Penner Photography. Christian Narcisco from Visual Media. We have Alvin Bali from Caesar Stone, Canada and Dulux Paints. We have the Entrepreneur Society International. And I think we're going to have Daryl take it away now and give us to let us know what's inside that crystal ball and how things have been going for March. Hi, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, my name is Daryl Walsh. I'm a residential and commercial real estate agent here in Winnipeg, and uh, it's my job to present the market statistics. And my port report does say, oh, welcome back, everyone. 
Good to see you all. Uh, although we're all cooped up. Let's keep it on that slide for a moment. Um, I've got a little bit of literature that I'm going to read. It's, it's very short. And um, this, this is information straight from the uh, Manitoba Real Estate Association. Uh, February continued to show significant increase over the same month last year with uh, 1,240 sales, which is a 48% rise in the early market activity. So we are hitting a spring market in February before even March, uh, it, it was incredible. 68% increase in comparison uh, for the five-year average. $395 million in volume were transacted in February, which was a huge jump of 67% over February of last year. Year to date, so basically from the beginning of January till the end of February, we don't have our March stats yet, uh, we did 2,174 sales, a 39% increase, while the dollar volume was up $680 million. We vaulted 53% over the same period as last year. So it, that is incredible. Now we can go to the next slide. So this talks about our residential detached. I'm going to break this down into the three sectors, the detached, the attached, and the condominium market. And you can see a little bit, we may flip back and forth between the, the slides, but right now we've got um, average sale price was $360,000 in February, and the average square footage was $1,359. If you go to the next slide, so this is our year to date. So our previous... Um, just the month of, of February, our average sale price was uh, 360194 but year to date is 56077 So already an increase from the uh, beginning of the year to now. Next slide, please. So this shows our residential attached market, and we have got some incredible numbers in here. If we look at our duplexes, unit sales up over last year, 103%. These numbers are insane. Price over last year for duplexes, 19% increase. So if you own a duplex, you're doing pretty good. Average sale price of duplexes were 301,526. Townhouses up 120% unit sales over last year. Price over last year's prices are almost 40%. That is insane. Anyways, average market sale price at 328,113. Our single attached, so these are going to be side by sides. The kind of our the on the lower end of things, uh, unit sales. We only we're down actually three point two percent, up a measly 03 percent over last year. On our average sale price is two eighty one seventy four. But some of those numbers are incredible in there. Next slide, please. And this is going to show us our attached houses. So attached houses can be townhouses. They can be duplex. They can be side by sides. Our average price again is. This is for the month of February, 308,368. Next slide is 294 from year to date to now. So again, February price jumped up from 308,368 to 294, sorry, went up from 294 to the 308. So again, a a substantial increase just in one month. I can hardly wait to see what the March statistics are going to look like. We're probably going to blow it away again. All right, next slide. This is our condo sales report. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. If you're a condo owner and you're looking for a value of increase, condos have been lagging for probably the past 10 years, but we're seeing some growth right now. Uh, average price over last year has gone up five and a half, five point seven percent. Uh, sales volume is up dramatically, fifty eight percent since last year. So that's great. If you've got a condo and you want to get rid of it, if you own condos and you've got an investment in them, the, those investments are coming back. We talk about real estate as a uh, sure thing. As long as you hold on to it, you're never going to lose money. It just it may take a little bit longer to regain your money. Condos are on the rebound right now. Okay, next slide. This is talking about condos as well. There we go. So February condo sales, um, average price was 242. And remember guys, when we say average, so you've got the East end, the West end, the North end, the South end, and everything in between. So we take all of those statistics, 
we combine them together, we divide it by the number of sales that we have. That's how we get our average. So um, if we go to the next slide, you're gonna see that our year to date sale price is a little lower at 234.917 compared to 242.571, which was our just our February stats. So again, all of these numbers are on an increase, which is great. Real estate is a fantastic investment, no matter what avenue you choose. If you want to be able to predict the future, buy real estate, I guarantee it's going to go up. Next slide. All right, I guess this is my last side. And this is, there's a kind of a puzzle here, not really. The key to your success is to build your team and bring in the bucks. So what you have here with the people that surround you is a fantastic team. You've got people that have a ton of education. They're gonna keep you from falling into those pits and help you to be successful. We're gonna to go to the last slide and I'm gonna tell everybody, you got this, <laughs> do it. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask us any questions that you have. Uh, in fact, I would like to say if anybody has anything that they want to see in the next presentation, please DM me or email me and I will do my best to put it together. That's it for me. You guys have yourself a great evening. I have to deal with a couple of offers with a couple of students. Um, one, of our, one of our students was last month's uh, award winner, uh, Sam Alumba, or he, and uh, we're dealing with a couple of offers. So I, I may have some more success stories for you guys. So have a great night. Enjoy the rest of the show. And thanks for having me on guys. Okay, thank you, Dale. Next up is our legal update from Brendan Mahatu. I believe he's on a video for us today. So securing financing for any kind of project is becoming increasingly difficult. Stress tests, the amount of things that you have to go through at the bank to get a loan. A lot of people don't realize that you can maximize the potential of your home. And unlocking 75% of the equity, if you have uh, fully paid for property, can really go a long way. $50,000 worth of value and not doing anything in the world with it. Just going to work every day, saving a little bit more, not maximizing the potential. With that $350,000 worth of value, you can unlock with some private lenders up to 75% of that value. And you can have a mortgage placed on your property and use that capital to make a purchase, uh, whether it be commercial or residential. So that was just a clip of our legal sponsor, Brendan Mahatu, and he is available to be contacted. There's his contact information of himself and his assistant, Pam, on the screen. So if you need any legal services for real estate, uh, setting up corporations or anything like that, uh, please reach out to Brennan. He's awesome. Thanks, Keith. I think next up we have our property manager, Garrett Wong from Upper Edge Property Management. He's also left us with a video. So let's take a peek at this one here. So you want to own a rental property? My name is Garrett Wong, owner of Upper Edge Property Management. Welcome to the very first video in the series and in this segment we're going to be discussing why should you invest in a rental property. Are you ready? Let's get right into it. So why invest in a rental property? Well it's important to speak about other types of investments first. We've got stocks, RSPs, GICs, you can even leave money in the bank. Um, but back to basics. So what is an income property? Well, the definition is it's property bought and developed with the intention of earning revenue from it. We have different types of income property. You've got residential, single family homes, multiplexes, apartment blocks, commercial. I think the main thing is how do you make money in that? There's cash flow, property appreciation, there's principal pay down by the tenant paying the rent, tax write-offs, uh, we also have ROI or return on investment. Let's talk about a $50,000 investment at 7%. Um, if you know anything about investment, there's that rule of 72 where it would take at 7% 10 years to double your money. What can you do with that steady 7%? So let's take the same $50,000 investment, purchase a rental property, you add your cash flow, appreciation, principal pay down. I would say most people on an average property would earn 20 to 25,000 
a year on a $50,000 investment, and that's a 50% ROI. It sounds a little bit better than leaving your money in a bank, doesn't it? To summarize, rental property is a great way to build operational and generational wealth. And the next segment, we're going to be going back to basics and we're going to be answering the question, what is equity? Want to be notified when the next segment is released? Hit that subscribe and like button on the video. We'll see you next time. Okay, thank you, Garrett Wong. You know, I really uh, like that video that Garrett put out. We often talk a lot in our, through our academic training about the four benefits of real estate investing and how you not only gain from capital appreciation, but you gain from the tax benefits, from the cash flow, as well as the, appreci as well as the appreciation and the mortgage pay down. So I like that you touched on a lot of those topics there. And I know he touches on a lot of topics uh, related to property management as well. So check out Garrett Wong and Upper Edge Property Management if you're in the need for that. Now, a lot of the folks who are newer, who are starting out, well, you're going to, you're going to encounter fear. You're going to be afraid of taking that, that first step to getting into real estate investing. So we just want to take a second here to talk about fear and mindset. So remember that what you're doing today you're already giving up a day of your life. We only have so many of these. So it's important to make each and every day count. And the key to a successful life is simply having a series of successful days. Now, every day doesn't have to be a home run, but what it means is just every day you take a step towards achieving a goal. It's the, not the number of things that you do in the day. It's just having the efficiency on each of the things that you do so that you accomplish something towards that goal. If you make a list of six things and then you put them in priority order and then you work on number one to completion before moving on, you will move towards your goal in a very deliberate manner and you will build that series of actions every day. Making that decision, it removes the doubt, it removes the fear, it removes the worry and it brings order to your life. The law of cause and effect guarantees success. Now I know that takes a lot to, to process and there will be people that are saying that doesn't actually help me get through the fear. So we've got a short video here from somebody you might recognize, Will Smith, talking about a very extreme example of overcoming fear. So take his example and see how you can use it to sign on the dotted line to buy that first property, to commit to that first mortgage. Skydiving is a really interesting confront with fear. <laughs> so I gotta stand up, I'm sorry, I gotta stand up. <laughs> you go out the night before and you, you know, you take a drink with your friends and somebody says, yeah, we should go skydiving tomorrow. And you go, yeah, we'll go skydiving tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, you go, yeah. And everybody goes, yeah. And you go home by, you by yourself, you're like, hmm. <laughs> Right, you're like, well, I mean, they, they was drunk too. <laughs> so then that night you're laying in your bed and you just keep, <sighs> and you're terrified. You keep imagining over and over again, jumping out of an airplane and you can't figure out why you would do that. So you get there and then you have this safety brief and you're standing there and the guys will tell you, well, if the chute doesn't open, what's gonna happen is you're doing, you, well, well, why the hell, why, what could happen? <laughs> So you get onto the airplane and you're sitting there and, and you know, it's extra because you're sitting on some dude's lap, some stranger, <laughs> trying to make small talk, yeah, man. You, so you do, you'd be, you be jumping with people all the time, huh? You <laughs> so you fly and you go up to 14,000 feet and somebody opens the door. And in that moment, you realize you've never been in a freaking airplane with the door open. <laughs> terror, 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 terror. And then people start going out of the airplane. And the guy walks you up 
to the end of the thing and you're standing and your toes are on the edge and you're looking out down to death. They say on three. One. Two. And he pushes you on two because people grab on three. And you fall out of the airplane. And in one second, you realize that it's the most blissful experience of your life. You're flying. There's zero fear. You realize that the point of maximum danger is the point of minimum fear. The lesson for me was, why were you scared in your bed the night before? What do you need that fear for? Everything up to the stepping out, there's actually no reason to be scared. And then in that moment, all of a sudden, where you should be terrified is the most blissful experience of your life. And God placed the best things in life on the other side of fear. That was my right. experience with, uh, with skydiving and fear. All right. All right. So, so pract practically speaking. But I didn't like that take. I'm going to do it again. Back to the top. <laughs> I can sell that better. I can sell it better. So see what Will Smith said about fear there. There's, there's no reason to be afraid the night before lying in your bed. There's literally nothing to fear there. But when you get up to the airplane and you go to step out of it, who does he have with him? He's not by himself. He's strapped to someone that's had 5,000, 10,000 jumps. When I went for my first skydive, the guy, the guy I was strapped to had done it 10,000 times. So do you think I had confidence in the guy I was strapped to? For sure, because he'd done it 10,000 times before. So one of the ways that we help overcome fear in the Teammate Academy is that we provide coaching. And we provide that help, that person that you can literally strap yourself to us before you jump out of that airplane and sign your name on the dotted line. And it just occurred to me that we should really make a, a teammate academy skydiving thing. I just thought of this while watching the video. So for our July meeting, we're going to go skydiving. Who's with me? Don't everyone speak at once. Yeah. Okay. I'll just I'll just leave that sitting there. <laughs> I really like that video, Keith. That resonated really well with me. That was a cool video. Thanks for sharing that. You're very welcome. So now now we turn to our, our guest of honor here. So I'll turn it to Vishal to introduce him. Cool. So today we are very lucky to have our very own Michael Reimer speak to us about construction and new builds. Um, Michael Reimer is a very well respected entrepreneur in the city of Winnipeg. And one thing I learned about him today, actually, was he's, he's expecting a baby coming down the way here. He doesn't know if it's a boy or a girl yet, so his fingers are, his fingers are crossed, but uh, he hasn't said which one he thinks it is yet. Right on. Thanks for the intro. <clears throat> I, think, uh, I think me and Keith are going to do a bit of a uh, Q&A uh, and work through a couple of slides here. Um, a little bit of a chit-chat. Yeah, and I think we're gonna. I know. I know we're gonna be talking about new builds and construction, and we'll get to that. But uh, kind of the to just to get started to introduce myself, I kind of wanted to walk you guys through kind of how I got started. I think it's uh, it's always powerful to learn how people got started, um, especially if that's where you're at. If you're looking to get started, or maybe you just did get started, it's always taking that next step that's difficult that requires yeah that extra little push. And, sorry, uh, sorry, Michael, you mean you weren't born owning a construction company? <laughs> no, no, yeah. I, I, uh, I grew up knowing absolutely nothing uh, about construction or real estate. Um, I had no, I had no concept that real estate was even uh, something that you could be par in part of or involved in. Um, no idea that it existed other than just to purchase a home for yourself and your family. Um, this property here on the slide, uh, five Aspen drive. So <laughs> this is a, a nostalgic property. This is the, the very first flip I ever purchased, uh, out in Steinbach. Um, 
I, uh, I had bought a house uh, for myself and, and my family and uh, they, the bank had given us a $10,000 line of credit. And uh, it, there you uh, go. That's all it takes yeah. to get started, right? Yeah, that was the seed money. Uh, so out, out to Steinbeck, I went and, uh, and bought, uh, bought a mobile home. So yeah, never renovated anything in my life. Didn't own any tools. Didn't know what I was doing. I think I was, uh, I think I was 20 at the time, I think. When, uh, so, so, when so this, this is happened. going back 11 years then? Yeah. 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 Very, very first one. And uh, oh, like, like I think it, most first projects, I don't know, they went, uh, it went really uh, unexpectedly. Um, all got all kinds of problems. Couldn't buy it. Couldn't afford it. Couldn't get financing. Seller changed their mind. Didn't want to sell it. Um, I think it ended up taking three months to buy the place and uh, renovated it. Called in favors. Couldn't sell it. Put it on the market. No one wanted to buy it. Couldn't get financing um, from uh, buyers, and uh, ended up selling it with a rent to own. So I think I did, I ended up doing a, a flip, a burr and a rent to own all on the, all on the all very in your first, first deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. May as well learn all the strategies at once. Talk about a painful experience. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to share about, about five Aspen? Uh, don't buy mobile homes. <laughs> Yeah. Too, too late i already have one yeah <laughs> yeah they don't make great investments um they're uh, it's kind of like buying a camper if you can if you can buy it and renovate it and sell it uh, to someone that wants it more than you then then great but uh long-term investments i think uh, you gotta talk to vernon maybe just buy the whole park yeah there you go uh, now in this particular case was was the issue that the park you were in, you didn't own the land under it? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, this was, this was a, like a, a typical um, Manitoba trailer park. You, you lease the land, um, which yeah, makes it difficult for financing. Doesn't really give you a whole lot of leverage. Appreciation is stunted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So on to the next one. Yeah. Now this looks like money when I first see it. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, this is a great example of um, one one thing that I that I've really learned is if you want to do well, you have to you have to do things that are more and more difficult. Um, you know, in my mind at the time, buying a uh, a mobile home was easy because it was cheap, and uh, and doing things that are easy typically give you results that come easy and, and, uh, and it's typically not worth uh, your time and energy. So you have and, to do and, things that are difficult. And, and, and that's because if it's too easy, everyone can do it. Right. Exactly. Like, like th there's a reason why it, it doesn't pay very much to pump gas or work at McDonald's because those jobs have been designed for people who are, you know, 16 year old and still in high school to do. Exactly. Exactly. Increasing the de degree of difficulty um, yeah, increases your return and it increases your, what you learn along the way to, uh, to always be stretching and challenging yourself. I think we got a few, a few photos of this place on ferry. This yeah. is, you know, for the, the guys in the group that have done, uh, have been doing flips for a while in Winnipeg. This is just like a classic hoarder's home. I, I see a very nice Christmas tree there waiting to be put up, or maybe that is up and it just fell over. Yeah. I think this was July. Yeah. Uh, and I was going to say, I'll go to the next slide, but then I'm going to exit because I don't want to stay on it. Oh. <laughs> please, please tell me that's not blood in the shower. Unfortunately, it's not. I think that would be less. Uh... Yeah. Somebody, somebody, was, somebody was having a haircut and they were cutting their own hair and they took their ear off or something. It's like, oh, that's terrible. But yes, why don't you tell us about uh, some of the stuff that went on here on Ferry Road? So yeah, I think Ferry Road was uh, is a great example. I know Daryl mentioned you know about having a good team, and uh, and like I said, when I got into this, I didn't know anything about finance. I didn't know anything about 
lenders or banks. Uh, I sure I sure didn't know anything about construction. Um, didn't know anything about cleaning out uh, a hoarder's home like this. Uh, so I relied on people uh, that I knew that that knew just just a little bit more than me and could point me in the right direction. And uh, yeah, thankfully, having that kind of mindset early on, you know, allows you to connect with people, allows you to be able to ask questions uh, and not uh, not be scared to, to say that you don't know. Um, no one no one will help you if they think that you know what you're doing. But if you're uh, if you can be a little bit vulnerable and and just say, hey, I don't know what to do here, uh, you'd be you'd be surprised at how many people step up to help you out. Having uh, a little bit of humility helps there. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it, yeah, it opens opens a lot of doors. It absolutely just, opens the doors. And just for context here, Michael. Um, so you did uh, the place in Steinbach, the mobile home 11 years ago, where did this fall in the chronology then? Well, that's a good question. I think this one, uh, this one must be about eight years ago. Okay, seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that'd yeah, be so, I, so I can so I can take a drive by now and uh, and Ferry Road will be a nice fixed up property then. Well, I don't know. It's seven or eight years ago. <laughs> yeah, the, ten, <laughs> the tenants may have done this again. You know, yeah, it, it might be ready to be flipped again. Who knows? So, any other uh, details you wanted to share about this one? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, I think the next uh, next section we're on is. Okay, so now, now this is even more impressive to me. Yeah, so this 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 property was actually purchased basically at the same time um, as as Ferry Road, very very similar time, and I I chose this photo to, to show everyone because this is an unbelievable mess. Uh, when we first showed up at the property, the uh, one of the family members gave us the keys, uh, and he went and stood back on the boulevard and said, if you guys aren't back out in 10 minutes, um, I'll, I'll call someone. I'm not going inside. And uh, we visited the property a few times over the course of the, the next couple of weeks. And every time we were in there, it was a different life stage of the flies. We'd go in there and there would just be swarms of flies. We'd go in the next time, they'd all be dead. We'd go in the next time, there'd be swarms of flies. Um, but uh, the, the reason this property, this is kind of, this is the property where everything broke. Um, I, at the time I was working full time, uh, I had hired uh, general contractors to manage uh, a number of different properties, uh, a number of different rentals that we were renovating and flips that we were doing and, and everything broke. All the systems broke, work wasn't getting done. Uh, people were getting paid that shouldn't have been getting paid. People weren't getting paid that needed to get paid. Um, projects were behind, they were over budget. Um, Everything, everything was coming apart at the scenes, at, at the seams. And uh, that's when there was a big shift in the company. And, and anyone here that's ever grown a business, they'll, they'll be able to attest that that growth is, is difficult and, and getting to that next, that next stage is very difficult. So there's always growing pains. And, and this, this was definitely your one step back before your two steps forward. Absolutely, yeah. So everything got restructured um, in, in the business. Um, we, uh, yeah, we, we got rid of all our general contractors. We hired staff in-house. <clears throat> um, around the same time, I, I bought my first company and, uh, and started to, uh, to think about real estate, not just as, a, uh, as an in and out product, uh, but started looking at the whole real estate cycle and looking at ways to, to manage that cycle right from conception, uh, be that acquisition or be that development and controlling the whole cycle of real estate starting starting with either acquisitions of, of land or or of a product and then being the one that's in charge of uh, of renovating that property having complete control of that of that part of the of cycle um, being the one that does all the finishing that does the design that does the staging uh, and the selling uh, in the case of a flip uh, we brought all our property management for all renters uh, in-house and built our own systems as well. Um, and we, uh, we managed that kind of that whole cycle right from beginning to completion uh, in-house now. 
And does that mean that right now, when I go to the next slide, that, that this is your in-house team that takes credit for this? Yeah. So this this is a great example. Yeah. This is uh, this is what they're supposed to look like. I, I scarcely believe these are <laughs> even the same places, but as but as you flip back and forth, it's like, yeah, that's the same window. Like you didn't quite get the camera in the same place, but that's the same house. That's the same house. Yeah. yeah. And in the first picture, it's not even apparent that that open door that there's something past that microwave. Yeah. Like yeah, there's a whole, whole other like, part of the house back there. There's a whole other part of the house, but you know you can't see it. Yeah, we never we never saw that part of the house until I think we owned the house for about two weeks, and yep. before we were able to even access that. And and so does this mean that you're you're to this day you you've still got like you know paper from that house that you have for your fire pit in the backyard? No, no, nothing, <laughs> nothing. You wouldn't want anything from. Uh, you wouldn't even want to use it for kindling. <laughs> no. No, no, I, I, I don't want to tell you about the things that we found uh, in that house that uh, was were all everything, everything you could think of animals, rodents, old pets. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so let's, you know, circle back to what you were talking about, though, is in this time, you found that everything was starting to break down. So you had people that were working on job sites that were not doing what they were supposed to. They were, they were not coming on time. They weren't doing the work that they were doing, but on Friday, they'd still want to get paid. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's a, just a measure of, uh, of, of control really is, you know, as an individual, you can only control so many aspects uh, of a project and you got to surrender that control uh, at some point to someone to, uh, <clears throat> to pick up a torch and, and lead that. And uh, in, in our case, uh, that, that required us, you know, hiring and training uh, staff in, in house to do it rather than relying on others. There's um, yeah, there's, there, there was, a, there was a big change there that, that needed to happen. Um, when you consider, you know, a good, a good rule of thumb whenever you're working with someone new is to consider their self-interest. Uh, and and how they win in a transaction, right? Uh, you know, we, we're all we're usually pretty clear on how we win. You know, when whether that's you know going to the store to to buy buy a new computer. You know, you understand what that transaction winning for yourself. How how do you come out of that successfully? But yeah, when you take into consideration the salesman or and the tech support and the retailer and the supplier, you want to understand well how do they win in this transaction and is it are they going to win when I win? And, uh, and unfortunately, if you don't structure things properly, that's not always the case. Yeah. Yeah. So then, then how did you, how did you actually go about bringing those various uh, skills like in-house you, you talked about buying <laughs> your first company. So did you actually buy like a small general contracting firm yourself, or did you actually sort of create one from scratch where you started by hiring like, a carpenter and electrician and a plumber or contracting those people to, to, a, to a firm that you then owned. Yeah. So, um, it started, uh, it started with, uh, with firing, firing everyone we had. And then, yeah, the little next step was I, I phoned everyone I knew, um, <clears throat> that, that knew, uh, construction and renovations, uh, more than I did. And I offered them a job and I said, come work for me. Uh, I think your earbuds just died there. Uh, we've lost your sound, Michael. Michael, if you can hear me. Oh, looks like yep. I got a bad connection here. Yeah. Oh, we're back there. Okay. Okay, perfect. I wasn't sure if those those uh, uh, AirPods or whatever, the battery died on them or something, but no, we can hear you again. Sorry. So if you could just repeat the last thing you said. Yeah, I said, I, yeah, so I, I hired someone, uh, a gentleman that was very experienced that uh, had his own company and uh, was looking for a change of pace, a little bit less responsibility, more time uh, doing what he loved, which was, you know, being on the tools. And, uh, and he was, yeah, he was my, uh, my first employee. And we, we built from there. I think we hired probably about 12 people our first year, um, fired almost the same number, um, 
as we uh, as we you know weaned through uh, who was who was a good fit for the company and who wasn't. But but you still kept that first guy, right? Yeah, yeah, I sure did. Yeah, I sure did. And he's still uh, still with me today. I was and... gonna say that that sounds just <laughs> in terms of like looking for like if someone's wondering about hiring, right? I mean, you're you're looking to have um, a construction company. You find somebody with a small construction company of their own, but they're like they are sick of administration and employees and all that kind of stuff. And they'd love just being on the tools. Like what you said there really struck me as like, that's how you find the right fit for somebody is somebody who's got an ownership mentality. He's a business owner. He's run his own company. He just wants to be the guy that like swings the hammer and runs the saw and not have to worry about people not showing up for work or making payroll, <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing. Exactly. So that seemed like a perfect fit. And of course, I'm not surprised to hear that he's still with you to this day. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's one of the one of the things that uh, as you get started, and as you start meeting new people, um, you, I think, you know, a great, a great skill to have is just the ability to, to talk to people to, uh, yeah, again, to tell them what you need, where, where your shortcomings are, ask them what they're good at, ask them what they love doing, you know, ask them where, uh, where they plan on being in the, in the next few years. And you can have these conversations with anyone. Um, I, uh, I find myself chatting with people uh, pretty much anywhere at any time, whether you're standing in line. Um, I've, I've gotten great, great customers and, uh, and great partners uh, at, uh, at the line uh, outside the Home Depot or, uh, or at the park with my kids uh, talking to the parents sitting on the next bench. Um, you can't, uh, can't underestimate that, uh, the opportunity and, and just meeting new people, which is, you know, you know, why something like teammate and these networking groups are so valuable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, before we get into talking about the new build side of things, it's like, we'll go to the next slide here and you can maybe tell us about some of the other aspects of your entrepreneurial uh, bent, shall we say? Yeah. So, uh, so affordable bins and junk removal is a company that I purchased. It was actually already operating for about six years. Uh, when I had the opportunity to buy it, and it uh, it fits it fits inside of that um, that real estate cycle. Uh, it's another uh, another company that yeah allows me to control another aspect. Uh, if you think of real estate as a as a wheel, and you got a lot of different spindles uh, coming off that center that hub, uh, every every one relies on the the spindles around it. When you're uh, if you're a, a contractor and all you do is uh, basement foundations, you just do concrete, just vertical concrete work and you're, you know, you're niched into that. You, yep. uh, you really rely on the guy that's digging the hole for you. Um, and if, uh, if he's not uh, available, uh, if he does, if he's not working, if he's not a, a, a good contractor, you know, you get stuck with his poor product and your business is affected by his and, and the same, you know, the framers that come after you, you have no control over that project. You can only control that one little uh, spindle on the wheel. However, if you can own the excavation company and the framing crew uh, and the finishing crew, um, then yeah, you you own more more cogs on that wheel, which gives you more control. And uh, and the way that I look at it, business is yeah, and more control is is less risk. Yeah, and I was gonna say the the other so it's affordable bins and the 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 sort of sister company to this is affordable junk removal is that what it's called yeah yeah same same company two services so we yep. have uh we have uh, four trucks um and uh five staff in the bin company so we provide uh dumpsters uh like the one you see in the picture here for uh for contractors and homeowners uh doing renovations uh and then we have a separate uh junk truck uh with staff that do kind of your 1-800 got junk style uh, junk removal and demolition. So. Yeah. And I was going to say, and I, I used those guys last month to help a friend of mine out who basically had tenants ditch on her. And, and we were like going in to like help her clean up her property and put it up on the market. So yeah. So your guys came and they were like, yeah, right there, like exactly on time and bang, bang, bang and done. And, you know, super polite. And even in the COVID era, like everybody's like wearing a mask and doing everything proper and and they were in and out and, you know, didn't complain about, you know, oversized couches to get carted out or any of that stuff. 
I'm sure they complained to you later, but they didn't complain to me. So that was awesome. And they didn't know that I knew you either. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, good. I'll, I'll pass that compliment on to them. Yeah. So I, 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 I was even like, yeah, so that much, so it's like your, your boss, is he like a real, like, you know, you know, slave driver is like <laughs> all that kind of stuff. I was like, no, no, they like, you know, they, they, they wouldn't even play along with the joke. So. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're kids. They're, uh, they're good. They're good guys. And, and uh, it, it's all work that someone has to do. Right. Um, at the end yeah. of the day, <clears throat> especially, I know we deal with a lot of landlords. Um, you know, we, we work with Garrett uh, at upper edge as well. And uh, yeah, any, any landlord here um, knows, knows what it's like the midnight move and uh, the absolute disaster of stuff that gets left behind. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess on to our, you know, talking about the the big one your your full full blown construction company now yeah yeah so vulcan construction is the company that was that was born out of that uh that uh, mismanagement um from our our trades and our and our subcontracts and uh is now yeah it's now its own standalone company so uh, we have uh, eight carpenters um that operate on uh, four to six uh, job sites at a time uh, part-time sales staff, project manager, and myself. Um, I'm still active uh, in the company as well. And uh, yeah, we do a wide range of uh, projects. You know, we do a lot of a lot of things in our wheelhouse. Uh, we do all our own renovations, obviously. Um, so typically, we have three to four flips or uh, rental properties under under renovation, um, as well as uh, work for some of our partners, some of our investors that are doing new construction and new development, um, and then clients uh, as well for residential and commercial renovations. Yeah, and uh, and you mentioned you mentioned the thing that I uh, especially wanted to talk about. You and I are actually working on a uh, a new build um, with myself and a couple of partners. But right now, just in this particular market, with the things as heated as they are. It's got to be especially difficult for folks to find flip candidates. There's simply so much, uh, there's so much demand for product out there just from people that will move into stuff that unless the house literally is as bad as that first shot of Noble was there, where, you know, the, you know, you're in danger of dying from a collapse of paper onto your head. Chances are you're going to find, you know, flippers can't find product. You're going to have, somebody uh who wants to live in the house no matter how bad it is these days just with the the uh the lack of inventory and the the huge demand so it would seem that like going to new builds might be a viable option and if you could just take us through like how an investor who had maybe just been flipping up to this point could make that move into you know doing a new build construct construction yeah i i think um I think Keith, that it follows a lot of the same principles at the end of the day as as a flip project. Um, you know, they're they're always for for a sophisticated investor. I think it's it's important to always always have a value add opportunity. Um, you want to you want to make sure that um, you don't just do one project. I, I you know I always tell people um, if you're looking to do a project, you got to ask yourself, would I do this project? 50 or hundred times. Uh, and if the answer is no, I wouldn't want to do this project 50 or hundred times, then it's probably a good idea not to do it at all. Um, but if the deal's great and it's exciting and you see great opportunity, and if you would do it 50 and hundred times over again, if you had the chance, well, that's, that's probably a good, a good project to move forward on. Um, and those, those principles of value add have to be have to be present in new development, just like they have to be present in a flip project. You have to have an opportunity to create margin um, and, and profitability, depending what your your end target is, whether that's resale or or holding and renting, you gotta make sure that you're, uh, you have a competitive edge to uh, to be able to to turn that into a performing a performing deal. No, that's great. Now, what about if somebody were out there looking and they find uh, a property that's maybe too far gone? Like I thought it might be a flip candidate, but frankly, when I look at it, it can't be saved and it's going to be a teardown. Uh, how does one go about, you know, like, you know, what would, what would one do if one found, you know, a 
a home that it turns out to be a teardown? Um, I think, uh, I think you'd, you start, uh, you always start at the end. Um, the same way that uh, when you're buying a flip, you, you need to understand where is that project going to finish? What's it going to look like as a final product? You do the same thing with, uh, with a new development. You want to look at your, the neighborhood you're in. You want to look at whatever market you're competing with. And you ask yourself, you know, what's the highest and best use uh, for this, this piece of land? And uh, how can I have it perform the best? Um, a great example, just last week, um, I had an offer uh, in on a property to purchase. A, it's a seven unit uh, rooming house. Had, a, had it for an excellent, excellent price. Very excited about it. Uh, I was gonna, we we're gonna turn it into uh, micro suites. Uh, okay. So and completely reestablished, probably not seven units, but turn it into a, into a functional safe um, rooming house compared to, to the, the, the den that it was before den, den, den of iniquity yeah yeah exactly and uh um before the possession date the place uh was broken into and uh and lit, lit on fire and it's near near a total loss so we we sat down with the with a seller renegotiated the purchase price uh and now we're shifting and and changing gears and um based on the zoning based on the lot size uh, the local city planner, um, you know, who we consult with, we're to trying to determine now what's the, the best and highest use for this piece of property. Is it to uh, attempt to salvage a building that is, you know, very severely damaged and a, as difficult as that might be, is that the highest and best use in order to maintain the number of units available? Um, is it, uh, is it better to tear it down and just pursue a, just a easy, simple, straightforward single family build? Uh, does that really, you know, match the the, uh, the neighborhood and the market? Um, probably not. Uh, but yeah, it takes a lot of investigation. And again, speaking to people that have been in those shoes um, before. Yeah, and and you mentioned there too. So so you would do things like speak with a city planner. Yeah. To find, yeah. To find out, like like you look at your lot size and you say, this lot size is zoned. R2, so I can do this. I can get a conditional usage variance to take it to maybe four, maybe six. Find out what they're what the the planner is going to support, what the neighbors are going to object to. They'll object yeah. to you putting up a nine, you know, a nine nine plex or something like that, but they won't object to four. You know, and your parking again, parking is another limiting factor that always comes up. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's. Um... You know, if you were if you were writing a, a how to book uh, on the topic, you'd have a very concise list of decision makers that you'd speak to. Um, but I think you'd be selling yourself short uh, if that's that's all you did was just you know follow the rule book. Um, a good a good <laughs> better the better method is to speak to everyone, talk to everyone. Yeah. About it. Talk to the neighbors about it. Talk to the guy across the street. Talk to. Um, the guy in the permit office, talk to the bylaw officer that's handing you a ticket, uh, talk to uh, talk to your coach, talk to your friends, uh, call up the call up the city and just whoever answers the phone, bounce questions off them. Uh, you'd be you'd be shocked and surprised at the information that people can provide you with, and just the ideas and the creativity um, that maybe you know things that you hadn't considered. Yeah, push the, push those boundaries sometimes. It's like just because you know just because. You don't think you can get a six plex on there. Don't give up and go to a four push for that six. Exactly. Right? Because you're going to make an extra, you know, you might make an extra 40, $50,000 for each of those extra suites. Yeah, absolutely. And you can, yeah, you can turn a project that maybe was going to net you, uh, you know, 10 or $20,000. And it turns out to, to be 10 times that um, by following a better strategy and better advice. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, thank you very much for, for all your time here. Is there any, you know, parting, parting thoughts that you wish to, uh, to share with the group? Um, parting thoughts. Yeah. Uh, well, well I, I was gonna say, let's go, let's go with how can, how can people get in touch with you? Vulcan construction has a website. Yep. Yeah. Vulcan construction has a website. Yeah. Feel free to, uh, to reach out to me there. If you guys have any questions or if you have any projects that you're looking for some advice or some pointers mm -hmm. on, um, myself or, or someone from the team would, you know, be more than happy to, to give you some information on, you know, who, either who to talk to or what direction to go in. 
um, it's a it's a big wide world out there and we might be able to make it a little bit smaller by connecting you with the right person okay and then also too if somebody's got junk removal or needs a bin it's affordablebins.ca and affordablejunkremoval.ca i'm going off memory here so yeah no no yeah you nailed it that's it yeah affordable bins and affordable junk you'll find us online we're all over the place awesome well thank you very kindly and if you, if you don't mind sticking around till the end of the evening i'm sure uh we're going to have some questions for you from the group and just to remind everyone uh we've got a q and a tab here so type your questions into the q a and uh, Michael or one of the other coaches will uh, will respond to those. So we'll uh, with that, I believe we are turning it back over to our MC for the evening, Vishal. Hey, thank you, Keith and Michael. And Michael, before you go, I got one quick question. It's kind of obvious to me, but did doing a, a whole bunch of um, hoarder houses have any influence on your decision to start a trash removal company or a bin company? Did that have any coincidence <laughs> together? It did. It did. <laughs> yeah. It did. Good. Bye. That's been... cool. Um, you know, some common threads of uh, what, of some common traits of why some su investors are successful. I think what some common threads are that they seek mentorship. They have that hustle and they have the commitment and that consistency to the hustle and to the commitment, as well as they seek higher education, as well as they build a power team. At Teammate Real Estate, we provide personalized mentorship. And, uh, and full access to a power team that helps produce consistent results. On the next slide here, we talk about the, T the TMR Academy. And as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, we have different programs that we offer. And those kind of line up with your bachelor's, your master's, your PhD. Uh, right here again on the screen, there's different options and packages for mentorship that we offer. There is a bronze 365, there's a silver, gold, and platinum. Um, I encourage you to fill out one of those strategy session cards and get in touch with the coach if you have any questions about the packages that we have at TMR. On the next slide, we could talk a little bit about what you will learn with, when you join TMR. What, you will, what will you be doing? Um, I love talking about this slide here because we do all of these over Zoom on Tuesdays and Saturdays. And what we really talk about is how do you find deals? Now, in a market like today, everything has become super competitive. But yet, I can assure you, on the MLS, there are still deals that are not being picked apart super quickly, as well as there's a lot of off-market deals so, and there's pocket listings. So there's a whole bunch of avenues to find your deals. You wanna, we need to finance these deals somehow. We discuss creative financing opportunities and solutions, such as a vendor take back, or, or even having a portion of the loan given by the seller. We raise capital. We talk about how do you negotiate the price Often enough, uh, we joke during our training calls, the cost of your training is often saved just in the negotiations of the price, let alone the scope of work and the resale of it. We discuss how do you write an offer to purchase and terms and conditions that protect you, the investor? How do you find this money? How are you managing this renovation? Now, when you, when you, do, when you have a rental property, we stress the importance of running it like a business. So the day you think that you want to do real estate, you're now a business. And we talk, we teach you how do you maintain and build a business so that you can scale it. How are you selling these rental properties? How are you going to refinance it to pull out all of your money tax-free? How are you going to JV? We, do, we have contracts as well as other people who want to JV. Um, having a hold call, opening an operating call, when to incorporate, how do you minimize your tax bill at this time of the year, April 30th is the deadline? How to maximize leverage and how can you really design that lifestyle? I think I showed before it was traveling that was for me. And I know from previous slides, it, for Keith, it's music, for Vern, it's spending time with his wife. So what, how can you structure your real estate business to do your why? So here's a little bit of an FAQ. Does it cost money? It will cost money. Will, will you have to do any work? Yeah, you will. Will you have to get out of your comfort zone? You know, one of my mentors, I really respect uh, one of his phrases is you to be successful, you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm going to say that again. He said, to be successful, you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So it really pushes you to get outside of your comfort zone. And that's when you're really going to grow. Um, will I get my first deal done? 
Um, absolutely, that's just a starting point. If you think if you look back at our investor of the year who does 42 deals in one year, um, you will more, more you will get your first deal done if you continue to work with us, and that's my promise to you. So taking action, I said um, before, um, it's about that consistency and commitment and education and that hustle. And that really, if you think about it, if you put one hour a day aside, that translates to one day a week because seven days in a, in a week, so one hour is, gets you one work week. That's four days a month. That's 52 days a year. That's essentially two months of two working months that you have just got extra by working an hour a day. So what what you, could you do in that hour a day? I think you go look at some rental properties every week. You make a goal to make two, three offers a month. You do a deal in the next year. Often students join us, I recall, and they say, we want to get one rental property by the end of the year. So often enough, there's many examples of them getting it within two weeks, three weeks, within two months, using none of their own money as well. So absolutely take action to get results. I'm going to pass it off to Vern here. I think Vern, there's uh, three investor of the months and uh, it, it may sum up to a seven figure number. So I'm going to let you unmute yourself here and take it away. Oh, this is a surprise. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure working with Ryan. Let me tell you, he bought his first rental property, a duplex, and is uh, it was functioning uh, as a duplex. And with his ingenuity, he spotted immediately, this can go into a triplex. And that's what they're working on right now. And it's going to be uh, coming in and appraised a little over 300,000. And you can see the numbers he's in for it. He is super excited super excited um, and he was just elected investor of the month just this very afternoon uh thank you thank you back to you Vishal. congratulations ryan thank no you. Vern, we got a three it's a three no we got a hat trick tonight so they add up seven okay. figures oh these were the ones that bought the yeah. million dollars yes yeah. 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 yeah yeah okay thank you yeah ryan's was one of them uh this one here with anita and alex prudnikow uh another duplex um, and I think the third one that'll come up would be, or Winnie Doan as well bought a duplex all in the same day, a million dollars worth of real estate all in the same day. Some surprising things about it. Congratulations to these guys, uh, all of them very active. Uh, when the Bird Two for One Coach Mentor team did a little switch and we were finding a lot of competition in single family homes but we also deal in commercial properties. Um, as many of you know, my background is in single family home, duplex, triplex, small apartment blocks, uh, motels, hotels. I've been around a very long time. Um, and what happened was we suggested to our protégés, let's make a switch. And they will start looking at duplexes, triplexes, small apartment blocks. These properties were bought on a day, and Daryl can attest to this, the very same day, the exact same day, single family homes were getting 23 offers and 27 offers. These three prodigies bought their properties below asking price with no other offers. That's what we're showing them to do. And that's what they're doing it. They're looking at commercial properties and we'll be talking about commercial in a little little bit here. Okay. Uh, what's our next one there, Vishal? I think it's uh, the, some emails here, but it just goes to speak, you know, when the single family market's hot and heated. One of the sections I said about what you learned was um, finding deals. Mm -hmm. When there are no deals in one section, there are still deals on the market, even off market, there are always deals, but it's what lens you have to view them. I think um, this next slide is about taking action and booking a strategy session. The coaches here, are Keith, Vern, myself, Valen, Nelson, Michael, Chris, and Patrick. These emails uh, are up on the slide here, and I think they'll come back up towards the Q&A part as well. So if you're friendly. Yeah, they are, the, they are the last slide of the, uh, the presentation as well. So don't worry if you're trying to write them down. They will show up again. So what's next? I think we got, as we talk about taking action, remember your plan for 2020. 
make this the year that, that really drives your financial, your financial independence. Learn something new. Perhaps make a decision that you want to get involved and started with real estate. Book a strategy session, as well as attend our next meeting on April the 26th. Which is the last Monday in April for those of you who don't have a calendar in front of them. So what's next for you? I think we can jump over to the next slide there, Keith. Let's see what this is. Yeah, so, um, so last month we talked about a course that we had just finished developing. It's our resi residential investing secrets, fully online. So it has all interactive lessons, industry subject matter experts serving as your personal guide to take you through virtual training modules, 10 training modules in total. It's a web-based system that's accessible anytime, anywhere on any device. The training can be completed from your home, from your office, from the beach, from a campsite, maybe not the beach, you know, today but you know the beach this summer you learn at your own pace online and we know that real estate investing can seem overwhelming when you're getting started we've talked about that over and over again tonight we've made it simpler by putting this online training together imagine being able to learn everything you need to get your real estate business up and running as quickly as possible now imagine being able to do that training wherever you are with your laptop your phone your tablet this online training platform works with all of these on any type of platform, Android, iPhone, Apple computers, PCs. It helps you learn when and where it's convenient for you in the middle of the night, you know, when you're, when you're on your lunch hour at work, however you want. It's got virtual interactivity. It's uniquely designed with testing mechanisms that allow you to actively participate and engage during the training to ensure that you retain as much knowledge as possible from each training module. So there's going to be videos, there's going to be pieces to read, there's going to be pieces to listen to. We know everybody learns with a different style. So we've addressed that by having all the different learning styles accounted for. Easy to use interface. It's a straightforward, simple web-based platform. If you've made it to this meeting, you can use this platform. It makes it simple for everyone to learn. You don't need to be a tech superstar to use the system. You simply log in and you'll be able to start training with a couple of mouse clicks, the same as watching a Zoom video. And we've got built-in accountability. We know that accountability is a staple of successful learning environments. Unlike on other platforms, you'll be able to track, measure, and monitor your progress to see how you're doing and make sure that you achieve your success. And so this is just an entryway the $29.95 gets you started. Then if you get through it and you've got the information, you've got the knowledge, but you just still need that help getting over the fear, that's when you can look at moving to one of the, the packages mentioned earlier in the academy that come with the coaching that actually help you strap you to, <laughs> to the, other, the other skydive instructor and jump you out of the plane. <laughs> And then next we have the commercial investing secrets. And I believe Chris was on. I'm not sure if Chris had to, it looks like Chris had to leave early. I think, I think uh, yeah. So, yeah, sure. I can, I can do a little blurb on that if you like. Is that okay, Keith? Yes, please. Okay. Um, this one comes with all of the stuff that Keith talked about, <laughs> the different techniques and uh, strategies of learning it. It's an online course. This is the beta version, okay? Um, and we at Teammate, we kind of like to tell it like it is, um, you know, if it's going to be good or even if it's going to be bad. One of the things about re real estate and especially commercial real estate, it's always pivoting. Commercial real estate pivoting, always pivoting, okay? There's one common formula that we noticed over the years and decades Training plus obsessive, dedicated learning plus patience, that equals improved returns. We've seen comments tonight about sophisticated investors. That's what they all do. That's what we all do. There is a creep that can go wrong in between, that can go wrong. The creep stands for commercial, real estate, always pivoting. <laughs> I thought 
Keith, Keith had a scared look on his face there for a minute. So training and learning in, in the commercial real estate space, they were and they still all the foundations for all your successes. And what are you going to learn about? You need to understand the classes of commercial, categories of commercial properties, types of leases, net and gross, uh, all the, the tenant lease variables that you can think about that pop up. You have to understand those. You need commercial property underlying financial metrics, choosing your niche and finding the, the commercial piece, the commercial piece that fits into your niche. You choose your territory. You need to understand a lot more about financing, different types of financing that come in. You're going to be a landlord. You're going to be amplifying your property of value in the commercial space or in the residential space, we were always looking to convert the commercial to a higher and better use, possibly in residential. Now, with what's been going on with COVID and stuff, I mean, all of us, every single one of us, every single day, we see commercial buildings and restaurants, a lot of space not operating right now. There is a severe boom coming in commercial real estate. And this course, will help you anywhere in North America. We already have people looking at it from California, Montana, Chicago, Denver, Florida, Toronto, Alberta, British Columbia, and Winnipeg. This is our newest product and it's in the beta version. It doesn't have the discs and all the fancy bells and whistles yet. And you can get it for probably a very small percentage of what it will cost when we finish developing it. So you can get it in the beta version right now. And we have been selling these. Okay. Back to you, Vishal. Hey, thanks for, you know, okay. Yeah, here. So um, our, they, before I jump into the Q&A part of this evening, I just want to say we are having another meeting tomorrow at 8 p.m. where it's going to be very specialized real estate training on some workshops. These types of meetings are going to be very open forum. So we're going to be able to have open panel. We all talk to each other and we all, at, we all talk with each other. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow night, we'll be discussing the Burr strategy versus new builds, as well as more advanced strategies on top of the Burr. So after hearing about Michael's experience there in new builds and value adds, let's see how we can compare them to Burr's. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go to the next slide, actually, Keith, and then we can yep. open up the Q&A. Okay, so who's got questions out there for Michael or for anyone else? I have a question for Michael. It's Vern. Um, is Michael still there? Michael, what Michael's is the still current there. Cost, cost per square foot on a new build? <clears throat> it's up. <laughs> it's going up. <laughs> <laughs> The, the price of lumber is going through the roof, right? Uh, it's it's high right now, and by tomorrow morning, it'll be higher. Um, lumber and drywall, rebar, it's all going up. Everything's uh, everything's climbing. Um, you can still you can still build for under two hundred a foot, but it's getting harder and harder, uh, and you're not building any. Uh, anything nice or anything fancy uh, for that price. Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, our competitors, um, custom home builders uh, building, you know, 300 a square foot for, uh, for custom homes and up and, and up from there. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was I was gonna say I've got a couple of questions I should have thought of earlier when we were talking. So what about the cost of uh, doing a teardown right now? Uh, what's it, what's it cost to basically tear down a, sta a standard thousand square foot, nothing fancy, you know, not even thousand square foot, eight hundred square foot fallen down piece well, of junk when, house. When uh, <clears throat> when I first got into the uh, the junk business. Uh, our uh, landfill charges uh, per ton were, I think, about $43 okay, per okay. ton. Uh, the latest update we got from, uh, from that was $83 per ton. Uh, so, and that's just over the a short number of years. 
that's gone up. Uh, your standard thousand square foot bungalow, you can still you can still tear it down for five thousand or less, um, okay. depending okay. on the composition. But uh, but yeah, no, that's that's another one that has uh, seen some pretty drastic increases. You know, mm -hmm. over a hundred percent in the last four years. Yeah, and and if I could ask you, it, you probably have some insight into this. So this is my sort of second question, sort of following on to what Vern asked. What is it that's driving these incredible like jumps in in say lumber pricing? Because I myself, like I checked, I have Home Depot receipts for I want to say July, and I still was buying studs at the two dollars and ninety seven dollar. Two two ninety seven price that I've been paying for the last decade, and then all of a sudden from July till now it, it's above seven dollars. Um, so lumber prices, you you know, to get a real good understanding of that you got to talk to an economist. I, I'm no economist. Um, I think on the on the I know on the macro um, <clears throat> level, uh, things like the uh, the pine beetle is is massively impacting lumber prices in North America. Uh, BC lost uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of uh, a forest due to the pine beetle. Um, <clears throat> you have about, I think it's uh, three to five years to harvest uh, trees that have been killed uh, by the pine beetle. So they, they gave uh, lumber companies the free for all to harvest anything that was dead. Um, so there's a huge uh, oversupply that happens because these companies are are trying to to harvest this lumber um, uh, despite any kind of demand, so you know that that in, it could in, in some ways uh, artificially lower prices. Uh, and now, uh, you know, places like Europe, uh, there's actually they actually have cheaper lumber than we do, uh, and they're they're considering bringing lumber uh, across the ocean uh, for consumption here uh, because they've had such an overstock of it. How crazy is that? Yeah, so those are some of the importing are, lumber into a into the country that probably has the most of it on the planet. Well, exactly right. We got we got one of the biggest forests uh, yeah, in the world uh, here, and uh, so that's on a macro level. And then obviously, you know, on a, on a more micro level, <laughs> um, on a more micro level, this is uh, this is my daughter Elise here that's uh, joining us. Um, Hi, Elise. We have. Uh, we have COVID, right? So we have mills that are shut down. Um, we have uh, supply chains that are that are affected, and then all this pent up demand uh, from the last year that's just being unleashed on the market now. So, so that's the fact that like everybody that's that's working from home and that they're all renovating and that sort of stuff. So there's like simply Home Depot and Rona are experiencing just giant sales volumes. Uh, I, I think I think even even bigger than that is is someone that's building the the 250 unit building uh, yep. waited six months, right? And then uh, things settle down, and then they push the button to get it going again. Uh, those 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 large scale projects that just paused, uh, but new projects that were already financed, that already had start dates a year down the road, they were moving ahead one way or the other. So it, yeah, there's there's a lot of that happening uh, right across the world, really. Okay. And uh, I've got a question here in the chat from, uh, from Nelson and from Carlo. Uh, Michael, what do you predict is going to happen in the remainder of 2021 and moving into 2022 with regards to infills and new builds? Are they going to slow down or are they going to increase? <laughs> That's a great question. I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, there's you got good reasons for for both things to happen um <clears throat> with uh typically with uncertainty uh people don't take action and they they don't take risks when there's uncertainty uncertainty freezes up markets um at the same time you know we have low interest rates that makes it more appealing for people to to borrow and but we have higher costs of construction um, Winnipeg is still one of the most affordable places to buy real estate in the country. Um, I think we have a long ways to go uh, to see uh, our prices come anywhere close to uh, our neighbors to the east and the west. Um, 
I, uh, whenever anyone asks me about new construction, uh, especially new home building, uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, grandfather was building new homes in the 70s. And uh, he, uh, he always tells me, you know, back then, we couldn't believe it. There were so many new homes being built. Who's going to move into all these homes? There's never going to be, they're overbuilding, they're overbuilding. Um, these guys are nuts. They're going to lose their shirts. They're overbuilding. And that was 50 some years ago. And we're saying the same thing today. They're overbuilding. Yep. They're, so they're, they're overbuilding. And yet, meanwhile, the borders are closed and we, we aren't getting new immigration and money is as cheap as it's ever been in history. So what's going to happen when the borders are, or sorry, when the, the immigration tap turns on and now we can, we can have new immigrants coming to the city. And there's already a housing, you know, a lack of inventory, you know, for Daryl Walsh and company. <laughs> one, one of the things that um, I've noticed uh, both here and on stateside is a lot of people are moving out of the large cities and moving to the suburbs. So a big increase in sales everywhere, just on the outskirts of every city. Even right here between Selkirk, Winnipeg, a tremendous, tremendous increase in sales. Um, well, and and in and in Steinbeck, where you were, Michael, maybe you should go get that mobile home back again, right? <laughs> or or buy the buy the park and and do a bunch of infill there. Land, buy the land. land. Yeah. Vishal, yeah. any other questions? Nothing else has come in. Carlo, at, same as Nelson. Is there any other questions from any of the audience? Okay, I guess the sound of the horn means that's it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. If there are any more questions, we'll conclude with tonight, and thank you all for coming. And I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow if you come out. Yeah, and if anyone wants a, a link for tomorrow night for our meeting, just get a hold of Vishal, please. Uh, he'll send you the Zoom link. We're going to be comparing the first strategies to the new builds, and uh, anybody, anyone on here is welcome to come tomorrow night and follow. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. See you all next month.